Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, final session of the RMP Summer Series. Um, this morning, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Julie Schwartz with us. And I'll briefly introduce her. Dr. Schwartz is a tenured professor in radiation oncology. She completed her medical degree and PhD as part of the medical scientist training program at Washington University School of Medicine in 2004. She then joined the faculty in 2009 after completing residency in radiation oncology at the Barnes Jewish, General, uh, Jewish Hospital. Dr. Schwartz uh, serves as vice chair for research and director of cancer biology and division uh, and Department of Radiation Oncology. She has held numerous leadership roles in professional organizations and is the current president of the Radiation Research Society. Her areas of research interest include uh, gynecologic oncology, tumor metabolism, tumor immunity, molecular imaging, and biomarker development. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Schwartz this morning. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, and get to share with all of you some of our work in advancing personalized medicine strategies in cervical cancer. And here are my disclosures. Uh, the outline of the talk today, we're going to really focus on our use of functional imaging for response prediction, both before and after chemo radiation, with a focus on FDG PET. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we think about some of those metrics and what they can tell us about the tumor itself and the tumor immune microenvironment. Um, we'll spend some time talking about our work using FTG PET to guide rational drug combinations with radiation and chemo radiation. And at the end of the talk, I'll touch on our work that's developing for genomics for response prediction to chemo rads and cervix. And this includes uh, evaluation of the tumor and host as well as gene expression from the human papillomavirus. And at the end of the talk, hopefully I will have convinced you of the potential power of combining imaging and genomics. So I don't have to tell this audience that cervical cancers that have grown just beyond the smallest in size are actually left intact inside the body and we treat them with curative intents with radiation and chemotherapy. And why do we do this? Why are we able to do this? Well, in part, because most cervical cancers are HPV transformed tumors. In theory, these are radiation sensitive tumors. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's an oversimplification throughout the talk. Um, but also because of the anatomic location of the tumor in the cervix, we can actually really drive the dose with radiation. And we can do it with a high degree of precision. So radiation comes in two flavors for cervical cancer. We use external beam to treat the tumor itself and the lymph node regions at risk. Um, in my institution, we do this using intensity modulated techniques or IMRT that's conventionally fractionated once daily radiation. And then we're able to give additional boost dose to the primary tumor using high dose rate brachytherapy. So this is a procedure in which we use a radium 192 as the source. This has a very beautiful radiation dose symmetry in that right next to the tumor, you see quite a bit of radiation dose with a very rapid fall off. So almost no dose to the surrounding organs at risk. So what this allows us to do, the sum total of these two treatments in the central portion of the tumor is seeing in excess of 200 gray radiation. So it's really, really a lot of radiation and we're delivering it with a high degree of precision. So each part of these techniques uses image guidance. So for the IMRT, we have the daily uh, imaging out on the linear accelerator. And for HDR brachytherapy, we're doing this on a per fraction basis with MR imaging and defining the target and adapting at each treatment. So high technology, high precision, high dose radiation treatment for an otherwise, what we believe to be radiation sensitive tumor. And also given in the context of systemic cisplatin chemotherapy, which is not only radiation sensitizing, but thought to have the capacity to address micrometastatic disease. So you think, well, this should really be a home run, right? Well, unfortunately it's not. We see about a 33% rate of failure in our patients, and this can increase up to 50% based on what the patient's uh, tumor burden looks like prior to treatment. So for example, ladies who present with positive lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis can be facing a 50% failure rate. So we really need to do better for these patients. So work in my laboratory over the years has been sort of focused on how can we identify patients up front who are at risk for failure from this uh, very complicated and advanced chemoradiation strategy. 
So the approach that we've taken is very translational. We have an exceptionally well annotated clinical database of patients. Oh, am I doing that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I see. Oh, we're trying to get rid of that. Got, got it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have a very well annotated clinical database. So thousands of patients treated for cervical cancer at WashU since the turn of the century. And these patients' clinical information, including their pathologic information, their radiation therapy planning data, and their follow-up data has all been prospectively collected um, and, and annotated. And, and what we've added over the years is a lot of detail about functional imaging. Um, How come I can't? There we go. Uh, functional imaging. We have all the information about their FGD PET scans and also their MR scans. Today, I'm only going to be talking about the PET portion of what we've done. And more recently, we've added a, an associated tumor bank. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of that in the next slide. But using the observations that we make in the clinic together with the imaging data and with the tumor uh, materials, patient materials, we're able to generate hypotheses about why some patients are responding and some aren't. And we can take those hypotheses back to the bench using state-of-the-art cell and animal model systems to test out those hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what we're really interested in doing is generating uh, new therapies, personalizing them, identifying which patients would benefit, what are the markers, optimizing the strategy with the thought that we could incorporate new biologics in a, in a thoughtful way to improve outcomes for patients who might fail the standard of care. And ultimately what we wanna do is generate clinical trials that incorporate these uh, data, this really solid preclinical data that we try to generate in the lab. And once we start the new clinical trial with a biologic, we turn the wheel again. We're gonna image the patient with functional imaging that makes sense. We're gonna sample the tumors again. And the goal of that is to see if the new drugs are really doing what, what we think they're, they're doing uh, in the tumors. So our tumor bank was started in 2007. And for those who, of you who do GYN brachytherapy, this is a WASHU scheduling. So it's a modified split fill pelvis technique. So almost all of our patients are seeing brachytherapy on week one. What we do is we collect tumor biopsy and blood when the patients present prior to treatment, and then as subsequent weeks when they present for brachytherapy. Um, well, I'm getting spotlighted <laughs> uh, for brachytherapy procedures. So it, it really reduces the burden on the patients to participate in tumor banking because they are visiting us anyway for a procedure. And we offer them the opportunity. They're not obligated to participate, but, but many of them agree. And so we've been quite successful in uh, patient enrollment here. So we collect at pretreatment brachytherapy fractions one through three. Over the years, we've added additional collections, including microbiome from multiple sites. Um, we now have over 350 matched pairs and even triplet longitudinally collected specimens from patients. We add about 30 to 50 new patients per year. And with the fresh materials, we've been doing all kinds of interesting things, including single cell and spatially resolved profiling to focus on the tumor immune microenvironment and the cells within the stroma. In addition to the tumor cells, I'll show you just a little bit of that data today. Um, and we've grown some patient-derived xenografts and we'll be working on uh, patient-derived organoids coming up. Um, so I told you we'd focus a little bit about the functional imaging from FGG PET. So what is FGG? It's nothing but a labeled glucose analog with an F18. So it's taken up by the same transporters in the cell membrane that take up glucose. GLUT1 and GLUT4 are the transporters that are upregulated in cervix. Um, once the FGG is internalized in the cell, it's phosphorylated by hexokinase, but ph phosphorylated FGG cannot transition further down the glycolytic pathway. And it's actually the accumulation of phosphorylated FGG that we can visualize with positron emission tomography. So this is an image from one of our patients. You can see the FGG PET scan on your left and the corresponding anatomical reference CT image on the right with the fusion in the middle. So this young lady has a reasonably sized FGG avid primary cervical tumor that's grown to involve the regional lymph nodes. And using imaging processing software that's present just simply in our reading room when we go up to hang out with our nuclear medicine physicians, you can actually draw a circle around uh, a region of interest, which can encompass the primary tumor in this case, in this example. 
And you can get all kinds of information just sitting right there in the reading room. And one is an estimation of the amount of radio tracer uptake in a region of interest, in this case, the primary tumor. And that amount of radio tracer uptake in that volume, that anatomic volume that you've defined, um, can be described using a variety of metrics. And the most simplest metric, the most common one that's used is the standardized uptake value. There are other more sophisticated ways to do this. I'm showing you just a simplified um, mathematical equation at the bottom of the screen that represents how that is calculated. But in general, it's just an estimation of how much radio tracer is being taken up in that volume. And Elizabeth Kidd, when she was a resident, my co-resident in our program, she's now a professor at Stanford specializing in GYN. She was interested in using our clinical database to look back at FGG PET scanning information, that is specifically the SUV from the primary tumor prior to treatment and seeing if that was associated with patient outcomes. And this is a very old study now, but still quite interesting. Uh, you can see that some cervical tumors take up quite a bit of FGG and others not very much at all. And it was an independent imaging characteristic of the tumors, that is, it's not directly related to the tumor volume. And when Beth went back and looked at patients' prospectively collected outcome data in reference to their pretreatment SUV max, what she noted just dividing SUV into three bins, high, medium, and low, what she noticed was that tumors, patients whose tumors had high SUV max, their overall survival outcome was decreased on a Kaplan-Meier curve. This is information from just over 250 patients treated with curative intent with chemo rods, uh, brachytherapy, extra beam, and chemotherapy at our institution. And the same was true for progression-free survival outcome. So fast forward now to 2021, we have the tools. We have the tumor bank now, so we can ask all kinds of more interesting questions about why that's happening. So this is uh, John Floberg. He was a Holman Pathway resident in my lab. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin. And John had a PhD in imaging physics. He had a lot of interest in FTG PET imaging metrics and validating them and understanding sort of the shortcomings of some of them and are they really good biomarkers or not. And so John took a modern series, so new since, um, since best paper, all treated with modern techniques, all imaged on the same scanner. Um, there are some variabilities in SUV that can occur institutionally or based on the scanner that you use. There is some subtlety to it. But suffice it to say, he could validate the concept that an SCV that was elevated above the mean was associated with decreased freedom from progression and cancer-specific survival. So he had validated in a second data set, that was good. Um, but really we were interested in the biology. So we went back to the cervix tumor rank and we asked and just compared. Am I out of time already? Yeah. Um, here I'm just showing you bulk uh, RNA seq performed from just a tumor grab, uh, just a scissor type biopsy, bulk RNA. Um, biology pathway-based analysis, so gene set enrichment analysis to ask what were the pathways that were upregulated in tumors that had a high SUV max. And what we expected to see was metabolic pathways, glycolysis, maybe P3 kinase, AKT, TOR, maybe hypoxia, for example, which is known to be a risk factor in cervix, but we saw none of those things in the high SUV max uh, tumors. What we saw, in fact, was a lot of inflammatory pathways. So these were upregulated in, you know, chunk tumor biopsies from patients with high SV max tumors. Here I'm showing you hallmark inflammation, um, NF kappa B, and JAK stat signaling. So if we took a little bit of a deeper dive to ask what were the specific genes that were altered in tumors with elevated SV max, what we saw was a collection of cytokines and chemoclines that are associated for the most part with migration of myeloid-derived cells into the tumor immune microenvironment. So specifically macrophages, monocytes, and neutrophils. Um, so you can use deconvolution methods applied to bulk RNA sequencing data to make guesses about the cell identities of tumors in the immune microenvironment. Here, we're just using one of those algorithms, uh, the CyberSort algorithm to ask, on the basis of gene expression alone, if we tried to guess what were the immune cells that were present in high SVMAX tumors compared to low, what would we see? 
And it did begin to show us the signal that perhaps there were increased neutrophils, macrophages, and monocytes in high SUV max tumors. And even within the population of macrophages, these categories are a bit controversial and oversimplified. But if you focus on gene expression associated with either uh, M1 type or anti-tumor or pro-inflammatory macrophages compared to those that are immunosuppressive or more M2-like, it appeared that the macrophages that were present in the tumor immune microenvironment of high SUV max tumors were uh, more consistent with the immunosuppressive phenotype. So that's interesting hypothesis generating data from RNA sequencing, but I always tell people in the lab, RNA, RNA can only get you so far. You're really interested in the protein, you gotta validate using an orthogonal method. So what we have used in the past is a tumor microarray. So we have 100, hundreds of biopsies on a single glass slide, paraffin embedded. We can stain those with immunohistochemistry to look at our protein uh, of interest. And here, John did some immunohistochemistry for surface markers associated in general with macrophages. So I just want to draw your attention to CD68, which is sort of a generic marker for macrophages. And he was able to show using the TMA that there were more CD68 positive macrophages present in the TME using um, this orthogonal validation technique when the tumors had high SUV. Um, so this is uh, Nishad. He's a very talented now senior scientist in my lab, and he was listening to John's data in lab meeting one day, and he said, well, that's really interesting. Let's see if we can modify our culture techniques in the lab to really get into what's happening here. And Nishad uh, started just with very simple co-culture methodology where you take a macrophage-derived human cell line that you can force to differentiate in vitro using a combination of LPS and cytokines to appear to have either an M0, M1, or M2 phenotype. And then he used a culture method where we have uh, the macrophages on one side of a window that allows secretable factors to go back and forth in the tumor cells on the opposite side. And using this methodology and a fluorescent now labeled glucose, he was able to show using multiple different serous cancer cell lines that regardless of what kind of macrophages was on the opposite side of the window, their presence alone simply inspired, was doing a really good job of inspiring the tumor cells to take up more glucose. And in fact, they didn't have to be sitting next to the macrophages. You could just take conditioned media from the top of any macrophages and squirt them on cervix tumor cells and they took up more glucose. Um, so we were interested in what was the magical factor or factors that was present in uh, the media from macrophages, and more importantly, how was the co-culture of macrophages together with tumor cells changing the composition of factors that were going back and forth between the cell types. So we used some commercially available cytokine arrays to test and see what's there. Um, and I just want to draw your attention, what struck us was differences in IL-1 beta and IL-6 that were present in the co-culture condition between cervix tumor cells and macrophages. And IL-6 has been known for a while to be a factor in cervical cancer, to be associated with cervical cancers with a poor prognosis. Many cervical cancers make their own IL-6. Some cervical, cancer, uh, cervical cancers have IL-6 receptor on their surface. In some cases, it's a full-length receptor. In some cases, it's truncated. The full-length IL-6 receptor signals through JAK-STAT. So we thought, aha, this is interesting. Stat activation sometimes also has been shown to be a poor risk factor in cervical cancers. So could this possibly be one explanation? And just as a proof of principle, Nashad went back to his panel of human tumor cell lines. He was able to find some that had baseline stat activation, some that had none. For example, here, just this ME180 cell line has no phosphostatic baseline, but you put those macrophages right next door and they turn on phosphostat. As a proof of principle, you can use a neutralizing antibody against IL-6, and you can rem remove the capacity of macrophages uh, to induce stat signaling in cervix tumor cells, and you can take away the influence of increasing glucose uptake. So all of this uh, suggested at least one idea that perhaps macrophages in the TME were communicating with cervix tumor cells, perhaps through IL-6, to inspire increased glucose uptake and pro-survival signaling through stat. Um, so what are we doing now? So we're interested in using more advanced omic technologies and applying those to our tumor collection. And I'm very pleased to share with you, we just got the notice of award yesterday to be a Robin Center, part of the Robin Network, which is an initiative uh, started by the National Institutes of Health in the US, uh, precisely for this purpose, to take longitudinally collected specimens and take deep dives with omics on them to ask important new radiobiology questions.
And I'm showing here the approach of our team so far, what we've done so far, we can compare across patients from a single time point, what they look like before treatment, and then more importantly, what it looks like during the course of treatment. And we're using both single cell and spatially resolved uh, approaches to look at tumor cells and cells in the microenvironment. Um, and this is just some very preliminary data here. And I just ask that you don't put it up on your website or something. Um, I guess I'm going to be on YouTube anyway, so it's too late. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if we look at the, none of this is, is this is one page, this is an example from one patient. So this patient had an HPV 16 positive tumor. We actually see quite the variety of HPV genotypes in our patient population, which allows us to do some, some cool stuff I'll show you at the end. But these burgundy um, cells are the tumor cells themselves at the pre-treatment time point. This is week one, this is week two. We see from week one to week two, we're doing a good job getting rid of the tumor cells and they're changing their identity a little bit here on this UMAP plot. But if we look at the beginning, we can see that there's actually pretty decent CD4, CD8 positive T cells present in the immune tumor microenvironment. But by week one to two, we can hardly identify any of the CD8 positive T cells. We're really doing a good job killing them off. And what's coming in, it, in its place is a lot of those myeloid derived cells. So macrophages and what appears to be monocytes, there's neutrophils here too. The monocytes appear to be very immature and coming in from the circulation. They have some interesting surface markers and phenotypes. Um, and if we look out to two weeks, what we see is we can start to see a rebound. We can see that the T cells are finally getting in there. And then again, there's further changes in the identity of the myeloid derived cells that are hanging out in the tumor immune microenvironment. So we're really interested in characterizing this further, understanding this biology, figuring out what these myeloid derived cells are doing or not doing that's helpful in figuring out how to do better with the CD8 positive T cells. Um, and this is a collaborative study. So uh, it's really fun for me because I get to collaborate with my husband, Brian Edelson, who's a macrophage and T cell expert. He's done quite a bit of um, single cell sequencing for benign diseases. So he has taught me a lot. And this data has been generated in collaboration with Lee Ding from the McDonald Genome Institute. And this is her graduate student, Isa Lee, who's been instrumental in generating our prelim data. And I have a longstanding collaboration with David DiNardo in pancreas cancer, where we have been doing similar work on the myeloid derived cells. And his uh, graduate student, Varintra Lander, who's actually interested in becoming a physician scientist in rat ox, so I couldn't be more excited. But what Varintra did here is she took only the CD45 positive cells. So now we're not even, we're putting the tumor cells to the side for the moment, just focusing on bone marrow derived cells from three triplet pairs. So three patients collected at three time points. What's happening? And just in this bar graph, I hope you can appreciate that the relative frequency of CDA positive T cells before we get started is pretty good across many patients. But by two weeks, we've really done a, a good job with radiation of getting rid of that. And then you can see the, um, the infiltration by the myeloid derived cells on uh, subsequent fractions. So very excited to have now the support to move forward with this. It's very costly, um, but the grant will help us uh, generate uh, more and numbers of patients to validate this. And of course, we'll use our archive resources and functional genomics to validate. So the conclusions from this part of the talk is that cervix tumors with high SUV on a pretreatment PET image are resistant to standard of care. They're characterized by a tumor immune uh, microenvironment that has uh, immunosuppressive and macrophage predominant uh, phenotypes. The macrophages that are present in the TME we think are secreting factors, one of which might be IL-6 that influence cervix tumor cell metabolism and pro-survival jack stat signaling. And we have early evidence that standard of care chemo in and cervix through single cell sequencing is decreasing CD8 positive T cells and increasing the total number of macrophages and neutrophils in the immune microenvironment. We're very interested in studying that biology further. Switching gears a little bit, um, now thinking about the concept of post-therapy imaging, and this is work that I was did when I was a resident. Um, this is a young lady with an FGG um, avid primary cervical tumor. She comes in, she gets standard of care chemo rads, and we check a PET scan again three months later. And it's just the, the comparison of the post-therapy PET scan to the pre-therapy. This is just a qualitative assessment. You don't need any fancy metrics. Um, and this in this patient's case, there was a totally negative follow-up PET scan. No abnormal FGG uptake in the pelvis. This is a complete metabolic response. It happens to about 70% of our patients. Another 10 to 15% of our patients on the follow-up study will have a residual focus of abnormal FTG uptake either in the area of the primary or in the lymph node regions. Uh, that's uh, referred to as a partial metabolic response. 
And this young lady actually has quite a small primary uh, cervical tumor. This is cardiac activity, bladder activity is normal. She has no evidence of uh, lymph node involvement. This was an HPV 16 positive tumor. You know, by all estimations, Jack Estero, et cetera, you could quote this patient 95% chance of cure. Uh, but this patient came, got the same treatments, and then three months later, this is her follow-up PET scan. So this patient has developed quite a significant burden of distant metastatic disease, primarily outside of the radiation therapy treatment field. So even though we treat these patients all the same, clearly the biology of the tumor and its response to chemo rads can be quite different. Um, and using the clinical database that we have that's well annotated when I was a resident, I was able to retrospectively go out and get really long follow-up data to ask the question, are, is the result of a three-month post-therapy PET scan an accurate predictor of long-term survival outcomes? And it was. So here's cause-specific survival on your left and progression-free survival on the right. Complete metabolic responders here, partial here, new disease. Patients with CMR do great. Uh, a lot of them don't have recurrences, or if they do, they're very delayed. Um, patients who have partial metabolic response, that's sort of an intermediate zone. There are some false positives there, and these patients are, uh, when we see them, they are biopsy to confirm. Um, and then if you have um, developed new disease, obviously just three months after the standard of care, that's a problem. That's an incurable condition. Uh, patients uh, die of recurrent and metastatic cervical cancer. And of course, when we make these observations from the clinical database, we can then prospectively validate them. And that's part of the work that I did when I was a resident. When I started my lab, of course, I was more interested in the biology. I could access the tumor bank. At that time, we did not have RNA sequencing. We only had gene chips. But the same strategy was employed here. So we took now just the results of post-therapy PET scanning, um, looked at gene expression and applied biologically uh, directed analysis methods with GSEA to ask what were the pathways that were upregulated in tumors that had residual FDG uptake after chemo rads. And we hit on pretty consistently PI3 kinase AKT signaling. This is an example from endometrial cancer where PI3 kinase AKT is a significant driver. If we asked what were the um, <clears throat> Genes that were upregulated, we saw both subunits of P3 kinase, P10 itself, uh, isoforms of AKT and many of the downstream targets. Um, and again, for orthogonal validation, we can go back to the TMA. In this case, we can use a phospho-specific AKT antibody that's associated with AKT being on. What we noticed when we did that on the TMA is that a lot of cervix cancers have phospho-AKT. Some phospho-AKT is on in most cervical cancers, but some had quite a bit of overexpression. These overexpressors are the ones that have high SUV on their pretreatment scan and the ones that are resistant to standard of care and they have poor outcomes. So we wanted to model this in the lab. So we have quite a variety of cervical cancer cell lines. You can get all of these from the ATCC. This is just a baseline Western blot. We wanted to pick models of those phospho AKT and treatment resistant cervical cancers that we saw in our patients. So we focused on the ones that were expressing a lot of phospho-AKT in baseline. We could pull those cell lines out. We could give them AKT kinase inhibitors or TOR inhibitors and interfere with their cell volubility. We could test their FDG uptake in vitro and show that they took up a lot of glucose. And then when we treated with AKT kinase inhibitors, we were interfering with the generation of message and protein for both the GLUT1 and GLUT4 transporters. But not only that, they were not as efficiently getting out onto the cell membrane when AKT kinase signaling was interrupted. We showed that using cytoplasm membrane fracturation, but also using immunofluorescence. So that was interesting, but not necessarily altogether unexpected. It's known that PI3 kinase AKT drives glucose metabolism, and it does so in a number of cancers. But what was it about this particular phenotype and this signaling that was associated with radiation sensitivity or resistance? And this is where we started to think about the indirect effects of radiation. So we all know that radiation functions primarily through direct effects or uh, damage to uh, DNA, primarily in the form of double-stranded breaks. But I think it's becoming more and more appreciated that the indirect effects through the uh, mediated by reactive oxygen species are very, very important. Um, so just to remind you, indirect effects occur when uh, photon beam interacts with water and water is hydrolyzed to generate reactive oxygen species that generates a chain reaction. 
ROSs are very important because they can modify many, many molecules in the cell. They can modify lipids, modify proteins, and they can also modify DNA. For example, ROS can bind directly to base pairs in DNA. Uh, the most classical example is 8-oxoguanine. When ROS is modified, uh, modifies bases in this way, it changes the structure of DNA and it inspires certain proteins to bind that are unique. These proteins are known to be transcription factors. So there is a clear connection between ROS, ROS modifications of DNA and the capacity to alter uh, gene transcription. In addition, when damage occurs from ROS in close proximity to direct effects from, um, from radiation, you have a more complex lesion that's more difficult to repair. So we wondered if perhaps the synergy was occurring around ROS. And this is a complicated slide, but um, the highlights are, we know that radiation therapy is inducing ROS. We also know that tumors that do a lot of glucose exist in a baseline state of oxidative stress. Why is that? Because glycolysis is uncoupled from metabolism in the mitochondria. A lot of the reactive oxygen species in there leak out. And so tumors that do a lot of uh, glycolysis at baseline have this Warburg-like uh, phenotype they are dependent on upregulation of redox metabolic pathways. In cervical cancer, this includes the glutathione system and the thyroid axon system. And what these systems do is they use reducing equivalents generated from glucose in the form of NADPH to metabolize ROS. And what was really appealing about thinking about it this way is that there were three drugs that already existed. So 2DG, BSO, and aronofen that were already approved for human use that we could use to target these pathways. So we focused on those drugs and went back to the lab to look in our cell and animal models to see what we could do. And this is Rashmi. She's now a senior scientist in industry in California, but she was in my lab for a very long time and did awesome work on this project. Um, she took the cervical cancer cell lines and tested them in vitro using clonogenic cell survival. Some were very sensitive to radiation, some were resistant. The resistant to radiation cell lines were the same cell lines that were resistant to platinum. They were the same cell lines that were taking up a lot of FGG in vitro, and they were also sensitive to inhibition of glycolysis with 2DG. We wanted to think about inhibition of glycolysis together with platinum or radiation to see how the combinations might work. Again, this is from clonogenic cell survival. Combining with platinum or combining with radiation actually seemed to do a really good job in some of these resistant tumor models. Um, and then if we just focus on the drug strategy alone without combining with any aspect of the standard of care, could we get away with one drug or did we need all three? And it actually turned out that when we used all three drugs, we did a better job across cell lines. And it was because some of these cell lines, you know, the pathways are redundant. Uh, BSO by itself can't do it always. Thyroidoxin is very important in many tumor lines and they can upregulate it as sort of a backup system. Um, we could use a series of sort of chemical correlates to convince ourselves that oxidative stress was occurring when we use this drug. So we were depleting cell reserves of reduced glutathione, and we could measure this mark of oxidative stress percent oxidized glutathione or percent GSSG was going up through this three drug strategy. And as I mentioned, for some cell lines, their capacity to induce thyrodoxin is very important. Um, we could use fluorometric dyes to measure reactive oxygen species. They're labile. They're sometimes hard to measure. Um, here we use DCFDA and DHE, which is specific for superoxide. DCFDA is more of a generic measure. But in any event, when we use the three drugs, we could see reactive oxygen species were going up. And then what about in vivo? So this is Mike Donner. He's now retired uh, senior animal tech in my lab. Makes me feel very old. But... Um, we could make tumor xenografts and immunocompromised mice. We could give them tri triple drugs, show pretty decent slowing down of tumor growth, at least in line with what was happening with platinum. And it, the animals tolerated this treatment quite a bit better than they do platinum. We could take the tumors out at the end and show in vivo that the tumors uh, were experiencing oxidative stress with this treatment. And then to combine with radiation, we could do a one-week lead-in with a triple drug regimen, hit them one time with two or four grams of radiation. And this combination, particularly as we're getting closer to brachytherapy type fractionation, was doing a pretty good job of, of controlling the tumors. So uh, conclusions from this part of the talk is that cervix tumors that have persistent glucose uptake after chemo rods are characterized by P3 kinase pathway activation. This results in an increased dependency on glucose metabolism. They exist in a baseline state of oxidative stress. 
and they're susceptible to inhibitors of uh, glucose and uh, redox metabolism. Radiation itself increases tumor cell oxidative stress through the production of ROS, and RT plus these inhibitors, specifically of glycolysis and redox, is uh, effective in preclinical models of this PI3 kinase activated uh, phenotype. So are we there yet? Were we ready to run the trial? And unfortunately, no, because we had a hard time getting our hands on GMK grade DG. Normal cells need glucose. There is some toxicity associated with this, uh, even though that drug has been around for some time and tested in clinical trials. People are working on tumor specific inhibitors of glycolysis, but I think we're, we're not really ready. So we wanted to look for other targets. And uh, around this time, a lot of good work was coming out of other labs linking dependency on glucose to dependency on glutamine. So it turns out that tumor cells that use a lot of glucose and do a lot of glycolysis, squeeze out a lot of lactate and use the byproducts for other means, they still have to run their TCA cycle. So how do they do that? Well, they do that from taking exogenous glutamine and converting it to glutamate using this enzyme called glutaminase. And glutamate then can be converted to alpha glutarate, and that can be used to spin the TCA cycle. What's appealing about this is that normal cells don't need exogenous glutamine. So it seems to be quite an, an attractive strategy for uh, tumor cell metabolism. The other thing that appealed to us about using glutamine is that glutamine or glutamate derived from glutamine is an essential component to make reduced glutathione. So we thought, wow, I wonder if we could simplify our strategy altogether by just targeting glutamine to glutamate. So now instead of using triple drugs, we're now incorporating the possibility of inhibiting glutaminase using drugs as a strategy together with increased ROS to increase the efficacy of radiation therapy in uh, resistant cervical cancers. And so there was a um, biotech company in California that worked on this GLS-1 inhibitor CD839 um, and did a lot of good work with preclinical toxicology, extremely well tolerated. They've yet to achieve a maximum tolerated dose in humans. They've done a lot of uh, combination studies with uh, biologics and chemotherapy. Not much work had been done in radiation uh, at the time, even still not much of it is published, um, but a solid lead. Patients prefer to take pills and it's extremely well tolerated, so had a lot of appeal from the patient perspective. So what do we do? Rashmi went back to the lab and now we're trying to get more sophisticated with our cell models. We're using CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer individual PI3 kinase mutations. Here I'm showing you data from P10 deletion, which we've engineered in isogenic cell backgrounds, but we've also now put in activating mutations in PI3 kinase as a comparator. At the time, whether or not P10 was inactivated in cervical cancer as a driver was a bit controversial. Um, so we did all the work using our specimens to show that, yes, in fact, P10 is a commonly altered gene in cervical cancer. And in our cell lines, when they had a P10 deletion, they were turning on expression of genes related to glycolysis and glutamine metabolism. So Rashmi could use these cell uh, libraries to study what happens when you take glutamine away from the media. Um, and I just want to focus your attention here on this same cell line, just with the P10 deletion. When you take away glutamine, it's really pretty effective in um, inhibiting their capacity to form colonies in vitro. And these cells with these mutations take up more glutamine from the media. And if you put them all in culture and you ask, what do these cells really care about? Do they care more about glucose deprivation or glutamine deprivation? Which carbon source is more important when you uh, grow them in a dish? And it actually turns out, just by looking at these green lines here, Cervical cancer cells actually care more about how much glutamine they can get from the media than how much glucose they can obtain. And when glutamine is limiting, they proliferate less. Uh, and this is uh, true in sort of the maximum sense when the cell lines have the PF kinase pathway mutations. Um, we could then go back and using our markers of oxidative stress show that when glutamine was limiting, we were inducing oxidative stress in our cell lines by looking at, for example, percent GSSG. And then finally, by focusing on these models, so these PI3 kinase mutated cell lines are the ones that we engineered, by giving even single agent CB839, we could impair cell volubility. And by giving this drug by itself, we were inducing oxidative stress. And sort of just to convince us one step further that the mechanism of toxicity was dependent on oxidative stress, we could do uh, rescue experiments by giving CB839 as monotherapy and then giving back uh, thiol antioxidants in the form of N-acetylcysteine. 
Um, what about its capacity to function as a radiation sensitizer? So this is clonogenic cell survival assays, again, across these cell lines with or without the addition of CB839 with increasing doses of radiation. And you can see that the dose modifying factor actually is pretty decent, especially when you get up here into the brachytherapy range. And this was a uh, cancer cell specific effect. That is, if we looked at, um, this is an HBV transformed cervix, ep cervix epithelial line that doesn't make tumors in mice. So uh, no effect in normal cervix, quote unquote, normal cervix epithelia. Um, what happens in vivo? So you can take those same cells and you can grow them in a mouse and you can give them CB839. The company told us we had to give 200 milligrams per kilogram by oral garbage twice a day. And my mouse tech, Mike, was um, thinking this is a lot of work. And he started to notice that the drug was working very well in appropriately selected cell models. Um, and so he started titrating down. So this is 100 milligrams per kg, even 50 milligrams per kg given every other day is doing a decent job in the right selected activated model um, to slow down tumor growth in the mouse. And then in that same system, we can give CB839 as one week lead in, hit it with four gray radiation and show that it enhances uh, radiation uh, control of the tumors. So right around that time that we were sort of focusing on radiation sensitizing properties in the tumor cells themselves, a lot of good work was coming out of other labs that were interested in how glutamine targeting might impact cells in the immune microenvironment. And this is a really nice paper from Jonathan Powell's group that was published in Science about five or six years ago. Um, and they used the glutamine antagonist DON together with multiple uh, syngenic or mouse on mouse tumors that were immunocompetent together with isotope labeling studies. Um, to show the following, when you pick tumors that are sensitive to glutamine targeting, not all of them are, but some of them are, when you pick those um, and you grow them in a mouse, in an immunocompetent mouse, and you um, target glutamine using DON, you find this, yourself in this interesting scenario where the tumor cells don't grow as well, but the T cells actually begin to function better. They have increased uh, effector function, they have increased memory. And why is that? That's because T cells are quite a bit more metabolically plastic than some tumor cells, at least with respect to glutamine. They can have other inputs that drive the TCA, specifically from acetate, they upregulate this enzyme ACSS1 that allows them to turn TCA using this input. Alternatively, they can go directly from pyruvate and input from oxaloacetate. Now, some tumors can do this too. And the longer that you target glutamine, sometimes you start to see these resistance mechanisms coming up. That's something that we're actively studying in the lab. I'm not going to tell you about that work today. But suffice it to say that this was very tantalizing, like one drug that could help the T cells and also impact the tumor cells is very appealing. But like a lot of things in immunology, it's not that simple, right? In the larger family of T cells, um, what you do to glutamine and how you target it can have different effects. And again, this is another wonderful paper from Jeff Rathmel's group a couple of years ago now, specifically targeting GLS using pharmacologic and even genetic manipulation. And in that study, they have some really nice data about how long you have to target GLS to get these effects. And it's really quite short. It's only about two weeks. Um, but when you target GLS, depending on what T cell you look at, different things can happen. For, so for TH17 cells that um, are associated with autoimmunity, when you target GLS, you can actually inhibit their function that occurs through ROS. But when you target GLS um, for the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and the TH1 types that are important for anti-tumor function, actually a lot of the effects that they observed were being mediated through chromatin modification induced by effects on alpha ketoglutarate. So beautiful study, a lot of stuff that's happening with glutamine and T cells that's worth paying attention to. I guess the third complicating factor, and we've seen this in our own cells, is when you target glutamine in tumor cells, what they do is they upregulate PDL1 on the cell surface. And this inspired, this was one paper, but there's many papers about this, and we've seen it ourselves in cervix. Um, this inspired the company to engage in a trial of 40 patients in keep activated non-small cell lung cancer, specifically combining anti-PD-1 together with CBA39. There was no radiation, there was no cytotoxic chemotherapy, um, and they treated 20 patients and there was no signal, so they reported that. And when they reported that, their stock lost 50%. They had to lay off half their company and they put CB839 development on hold on the basis of one poorly designed non-targeted study. I would say, actually, what really needs to happen is radiation or cytotoxic chemotherapy combined with this drug. So we're not giving up on CB839, but a lot going on there and we have to think thoughtfully about how to use it.
Um, so the conclusions for this part of the talk, cervix tumors that have persistent glucose uptake after chemo rounds, they are pietrokinase activated. They have increased dependency not only on glucose, but also on glutamine. RT plus glutamine targeting, this is effective in our preclinical models of RT-resistant PI through kinase activated cervical cancer, and there's accumulating preclinical evidence that glutamine targeting can enhance T-cell function in the tumor microenvironment. So I think this is really important and something worth pursuing. So is the future really metabolic therapy together with immune priming with radiation? A lot of news has been out there about using hypofractionated schemes together with anti-PD-1 and other checkpoint-related strategies. Do we need to layer on metabolic targeting? And I think this is really interesting, and this is where my lab is spending a lot of time lately. So we're doing preclinical studies. We're still focused on glutamine targeting using a lot of different approaches. We're using our PDX, and we now have an immunocompetent uh, genetically engineered mouse model. Um, in these studies, we're doing implant and in situ tumor models. We're interested in the primary tumor, the draining lymph nodes, the spleen, and the bone marrow. What's the effects of all of these treatments that we're giving um, on tumor-bearing uh, and tumor-naive animals? What's the effect of giving cytotoxic chemotherapy like platinum on the immune system? It's probably not good. Uh, what's the right RT dose fractionation and modality? And what's the right sequencing when you want to give other biologics? And clinically, we are running a phase one to two investigator initiated trial where we're doing a CBA39 lead in followed by standard care chemo rods with longitudinal collection, both before and after the drug by itself and drug plus chemo rods. And we're doing a detailed analysis of associated translational correlates with multi omics and pet imaging, and including now some novel tracers for tumor immune microenvironment. Um, so returning to our outline as we're getting towards the end here, just going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing for our genomics for response prediction, sort of outside of metabolism. Um, and this is Fiona Rees. She's a graduate student that graduated recently from my lab, and this was her thesis project. So she accessed specimens from the tumor bank uh, that we collected, and she did targeted exome sequencing of just over about 130, 140 genes, as well as HPV gene tiling for uh, 20 different HPV genome types. We have complete sequencing for 16 and 18, but uh, more limited uh, sequencing for the remaining uh, genotypes. And then we have complete transcript done for both the uh, tumor and also for HPV itself. And uh, she was interested in studying the mutational landscape, the transcriptome, as well as how that could be associated with recurrence or overall survival of their standard of care. And um, this audience has some experts in HPV, so you don't need this review, but uh, just in case, uh, double-stranded AKV uh, DNA virus are early and late genes. The late genes are the targets of the vaccine. The early genes have a very coordinated and beautiful set of regulation in basic virology that we're going to review in a minute. That's very important to know. Um, but E6 and E7 are the classical viral um, oncogenes that uh, bind P53 and RB amongst 200 other proteins in the cell that they bind and modify. And if we think about HPV genotypes, what does it mean to be a specific HPV genotype? So there's over 200 known genotypes of HPV. And this is an evolutionary or phylogenetic tree I'm showing you just to emphasize the distance between HPV 18 and 16. What does it mean to be a different genotype? Well, that's a 10% sequence homology difference at the level of amino acid. Okay, that's a lot of difference in protein structure on the basis of HPV genotype. So Fiona was interested in looking at outcomes. And as I told you at the top of the hour, we see quite the variety of HPV genotypes in our patient population in St. Louis. Uh, most patients have 16 positive tumors, but we see quite a lot of other genotypes. And uh, in head and neck cancer, at least in the studies that I've seen so far using the methodologies that they have employed, uh, 16 is where it's at. And it appears to be a favorable uh, feature. In our population, when we separate out HPV 16 compared to the other genotypes, like many others who have reported similar in cervix, 16 is favorable, non-16 is unfavorable. And in some cases, I want to remind you in this study, we didn't uh, do whole genomes. So there might be little pieces of HPV, of even more rare genotypes that we didn't pick up. So not necessarily negative. Now we're calling it undetected because we feel more comfortable saying that. Um, but back to the basic virology, so HPV virus infects the basal layer of the epithelium, and because it has to have a dividing cell to infect and to propagate its own genome. As the epithelium moves up in the layer of stratified squamous all the way to the tip where these cells are dead, 
it saves the L1 capsid to the end. That's part of how it evades the immune system. But in between here and there, there's a very detailed coordinated regulation of how these early genes come on. E1 and E2 come on first. E6 is on first by itself. And then there's a slow transition to E7. They're not commonly um, expressed together. Um, and, uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, in fact, the virus is so interested in controlling when E6 is on and when E7 is on that there's actually an alternate transcript, E6 star, that makes a protein that actually interferes with E6 function. So in normal HPV virology, actually what happens is you get full length E6 expressed for a period of time, then E6 star and E7 are expressed together. And so there's an effort on the part of the virus to shut off E6 um, before E7 is expressed. So Fiona was interested in seeing, well, what are the transcripts of HPV that are left over or residual in these tumors? And could those, because they can bind so many other proteins in the cell, what could be happening with respect to radiation resistance? And she found that actually across the HPV genotypes, it really doesn't matter. Even if you're a 16 positive tumor, if your tumor overexpresses E6 star, you have a worse outcome after chemo -rads. So Fiona went back to the lab and she engineered some cervix cancer cell lines to overexpress either full length E6 or E6 star. And it turns out that both of those engineered cervical cancer cell lines are resistant to radiation, but through different mechanisms. So I'm just gonna fly through this because we're about to run out of time here. But for the tumor cells that overexpress full length E6, it appears that they have favorable or increased capacity to repair DNA. Uh, they do it faster. If they overexpress E6 star, on the other hand, they have more senescent cells at baseline. And we can show this through beta-gal staining and P21, SAS, but we're doing all kinds of things to try to understand what's happening with senescent cells and cervical cancer and how the specific HPV biology can be influencing that. Um, and so you get into this interesting territory where maybe there are additional biologics that we should be thinking about for cervical cancer. And can we tailor those on the basis of HPV status? So for example, in an HPV positive tumor, if it's overexpressing E6, would it be that DNA damage response inhibitors together with RT is the way to go? And alternatively, if E6 star is overexpressed in their senescent cells, and this is shown to be a way that the cells are resistant to the treatment, will we then want to give analytics? And I'm not going to show any of her data here with these so-called HPV undetected tumors, but it actually turns out that genomically, these tumors tend to have 53 mutations and to overexpress cyclin D. Um, a lot of them are RB wild types, so you can give CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. They're very effective, even as a monotherapy. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to think about biologics and to think about them thoughtfully in cervical cancer. And in the last two minutes, I want to introduce you to Jin Zhang, who's a superly talented bioinformatician who uh, I have the pleasure of working with at WashU. He has his own group. He's very interested in integrating big data analysis. So thinking about how we can modify gene expression analyses to take into account uh, imaging information, for example. And this data is published, but what we did is we used SCV Max as a continuous variable together with gene expression analyses. And what it did was it revealed a subcategory of squamous cancers that had a mesenchymal phenotype. So it turns out that high SCV tumors also overexpress EMT-related genes, and even within HPV-16 positive tumors, they have phenotypes that are more mesenchymal. So then when we go back to the lab and we try to model this, you know, 2D culture is not really going to do it. We need to try to think more about organoids and how we can study EMT gene expression and the impacts of metabolic therapies. So we've been working on this for a while now. And when we switch to organoid cultures to 3D culture systems and we give metabolic inhibitors, we can demonstrate that these are now more impactful than platinum monotherapy. So moving forward, we're doing a lot more work in, in 3D culture. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that cervical cancer is a biologically heterogeneous disease, even with HPV-16 positive phenotypes, there's variability in viral gene expression that can impact how the tumor may respond to radiation and chemo rats, and that integration of imaging metrics and gene expression can improve our tumor classification systems. So is the future really multi-omics? And uh, we think that's true, and this is the work we're going to be doing in our Robin Center uh, multi-platform with DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolite analysis using both single cell and spatially resolved approaches. Of course, these are all just hypothesis generating studies, especially with a small N number. We'll be taking a lot of painstaking steps to validate any of our observations. And of course, 
nothing can move forward if we don't do the functional uh, genomics. And we're going to be doing that in vitro and vivo, again, focusing more on 3D culture, PDX, and immunocompetent gen. And ultimately, all of this is about uh, collecting more translational correlates, making new clinical trials, and helping our patients. So with that, I will acknowledge our department. I have a very supportive uh, department chair and a wonderful GYN team, Perry Grigsby, who's recently retired, and uh, Farouk Dadashi and Bear Siegel, who are nuclear medicine experts and pioneers in pet imaging, and my uh, the new chief of our GYN service, Jessica Contreras, and my colleague, Stephanie Markovina, who's amazing, but most of all, our patients for trusting us with their samples and our funding sources and the people who did the work. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Yeah. Oh, I really enjoy this. Um, one last about congratulations on the grants and do the longitudinal single cell work. So you sh showed the effects of the condition you put there in macrophages on the tumor cell. Mm -hmm. what do you We've seen effects of the treatment to chemo rads in terms of I don't know, M1 light or M2 light yeah. polarization. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting question. So um we've not specifically um in terms of the longitudinal single cell analysis of human immune cell subtypes, what's coming up is not necessarily your classical M1, M2 phenotype. What's coming up is some real interesting subcategories of macrophages that not surprisingly in the surface tumor immune microenvironment upregulate all kinds of things like iron metabolism and signaling. Um, there's a lot of changes in metabolic pathways and pathways related to the mitochondria. So that's some of our early hypotheses is really focusing on what we see from the single cell so far. Again, very limited sample. We need to validate all of these things. Um, in terms of single cell, the surface expression, these macrophages, like when my husband looked at this, he's like, this is weird. I don't believe it. What, what are all these weird receptors doing on the surface of these cells? So it's inspiring all kinds of funny business that I think we really need to uh, study <laughs> Uh, to answer your question. And then in vitro, it becomes hard to model a little bit the immune cells, right? Because they're very RT sensitive. Um, but we're working, we're coming up with some workarounds and we're actually interested in doing physical contact co-culture, which we think might actually help some of the cells survive uh, the radiation better, but that's sort of a work in progress. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat from oh. uh, Fox. Great talk, Julie. Have you looked at the pretreatment molecular characteristics of tumors that are controlled globally with RT, but sus subsequently metastasized? Also, have you looked for infiltration of myeloid-derived suppressor cells? Yeah, yeah, great question. So in the, in the beginning, that sort of immature monocyte population that we can identify, we think is coming from the circulation and it is consistent with myeloid-derived suppressor cells, although my immunology friends tell me they look more like monocytes than the classical MDSCs. I think we have a lot of work to figure that out, but in the human data, your second question, the answer to that is most likely yes. Um, and then in terms of comparison of uh, late metastasis versus local recurrence versus relapse tumors, that's built into our Robin Center. So we um, have a separate study that we're on purpose going to collect locally recurrent tumors and hopefully have some of the same patients that we can see up front, so their peak can fall, and then we can sample the clones that come back. I can also tell you that in our PDX collection from the longitudinal study, we have PDXs that have grown out from the same patient from multiple time points. Um, and using those tools, we're very, very interested in characterizing that tumor biology. What are the clones that grow out and were they sustained in the mouse? And can we really take advantage of the tools? Yeah, David. Great talk. Um, what do you think the implications are of the big decline in the C8 positive T cells in your patients when they start chemo RT? Yeah. Do you think it's an RT only effect? Do you think mm -hmm. it's chemo contributing? Yeah. And um, what do you think about timing of immunotherapy given that data? Yeah, awesome question. So I I'm a rat onc, so I'm very pro-radiation and anti-cytotoxic chemotherapy. So I'm accepting my biases, but I definitely think cytotoxic chemotherapy is terrible for CDA positive T cells and for the immune system in general. We're going to really take some painstaking steps to look at all the sources, to look at the spleen, to look at the bone marrow in our mouse models, to try to really understand that. In terms of the tumor itself, I think we need to understand better our dose fractionation schemes 
And can we get away with more dose in a single fraction and pause and let the cells re-infiltrate? I think might be the right strategy, but we need to collect more data. And with respect to when would you start um, immunotherapies, I think that's where the characterization of what's happening to the individual cell types are important. So it may be that if what radiation is doing is, is inspiring all these macrophages to fly and they have a bad phenotype, well, that's where myeloid-directed therapies need to be started early, right? And if the T cells are recovering and coming in seven to 14 days later, I think that's when you would initiate, for example, anti-PD-1. Um, so I think we have to be very thoughtful about when we're giving a drug, why are we giving it? Is it something that needs to be there at the time of radiation, or is it something we need to give radiation and pause and let radiation do the work and then help the radiation work with the right biologically targeted agent? But great question and things we're trying to work on in our model systems. Yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. And uh, thank you, Julie, for that. Um,